I think that young engineers, when you're early on in your career, don't be afraid to go and explore different industries, different roles, and things that you may find interesting. Uh, it's a learning process early on, and you will know what you like and what you don't like. Sometimes, but sometimes you have to do that by trial and error. And the things that you find out you don't like are just as important as those you find out you do like. So it may be intimidating to, to move around and to start new, but it's, a growing, it's part of the growing process. And I think that it's valuable for those that want to get exposure to, to different industries and positions in order to figure out exactly what it is that they want to go and do long term. Welcome to the Chemical Engineering Guys podcast, the show in which we share stories and tips from chemical and process engineers. We talk about student and professional life, as well as important aspects of products, processes, industries, and companies. But more importantly, what are the paths that these unique individuals are taking in this ever-changing world? Let's get started. So what's up, guys? Welcome once again to the show. This time I am with Alec Slungard, which is a process engineer currently working at Honeywell as a technical service specialist. So Alec, can you let us know more on you? Why did you decide to go into chemical engineering? Which type of jobs have you been doing so far? Yeah, hey, everybody. My name is Alec Slungard, uh, process engineer. been working in industry for about seven years. Started off in oil and gas, went into the pharmaceutical industry, and now I'm back in oil and gas working as a tech service specialist for Honeywell UOP. So let us know why the Jews decided to go into chemical engineering. I wanted something that combined math and chemistry. I found both those subjects really interesting. And in high school, I had a fantastic chemistry teacher who pushed me in that direction. So from day one at university, that's where I set my sights on. And I liked the fact that chemical engineering focused on processes on a macro scale as opposed to uh, more benchtop chemistry. Okay. Yeah. Actually, that's great because not all of us know what is chemical engineering. We just go because it's an engineering and you like chemistry. And as you stated, it's not that much into the actual work in a lab or in a bench. It's more about going to the process, huge machines, equipments, talking about kilos and tons. So that's great for you that you actually knew about it. So Alec, I know that you went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Can you let us know more about that? Why did you select the university and how is student life out there? Sure. So when I was researching schools to go to, I noticed that University of Wisconsin had a top 10 program and it's also in state. So tuition was a little bit less for me because I was a resident of Wisconsin at the time. And on top of that, it's known as one of the best uh, college experiences in the Midwest. It's got a vibrant a community that just revolves around the the university. So it was just it seemed like a great fit for me and I'm really glad that I made that decision. Okay, nice. Uh you were telling me that this is a top 10 university for chemical engineering, right? Correct. And how was the actual program? Did you enjoy it? Was it hard? Was it into certain Let's say the focus was mostly into process engineering or general engineering towards research. What was it all about in the University of Wisconsin-Madison? Definitely. So it was demanding, that's for sure. But the University of Wisconsin has a work hard, play hard mentality. So in addition to it being a top 10 chemical engineering program, the university itself is considered one of the top 10 party schools in the nation. So... Not only did we have long nights in the library, but we'd also get up each game day and go out and have fun and blow off some steam. So there's nice. a good balance there between 
um, rigorous academics as well as really enjoying yourself and experiencing a true, like getting a true college experience. Yeah, I know there's a lake right there. Can you let us know what do you do there, guys? Maybe catamaran or drinking in the terrace off, offshore, in, inside the lake. I don't know what's all about. How do you uh, make parties out there? Yeah, it's it's a wonderful scene. Uh, the One of my favorite spots on campus is the terrace on Lake Mendota. And <clears throat> it's set up just like a pavilion that overlooks the lake. Uh, you're able to go down there and, and get beers and grab a picnic bench and just sit down and enjoy the scene and, and um, talk with your friends. And they rent out uh, sailboats, so you can go sailing, you can go swimming. It's just a great atmosphere during the during the summertime. And then in the winter, sometimes the lake freezes over, and if it's ice ice is thick enough, they'll plow a little patch to play hockey or to play boot um, boot hockey so not okay. easy, so you can really enjoy it year round sounds a great place to study as a student life and also the balance with the high quality content in the university now alec i want to pass to your first internship which is uh one of your let's say uh first jobs that you took as a co-op It was as a process design engineer at Cargill. How did you got that co-op? I got that co-op after attending the career fair. So every fall and every spring, the university hosted a career fair for all of its engineering students. And recruiters send a couple of, or each company sends a couple of recruiters. They set up a booth. And they're there to talk with the students. So you show up with a handful of resumes and do some background research on which companies you want to talk with. And then you get a chance to have a five, 10 minute interaction with these recruiters. If that goes well, then they invite you for a short in-person interview on campus, either maybe that same day or the following week. And from there, uh, if things go well, you may get an offer. And that's how it worked out for me. And I interviewed with Cargill. I thought that they were a great company and the position that they had available was in Northwest Indiana, working at their texturizing solutions plant. This is where they made emulsifiers and emulsifiers are like thickening agents for sauces. So it was a good introduction into process engineering. I did a little bit of design work where I focused on their spray drying equipment and figured out how to, to optimize uh, their production. But it also allowed me to see many different unit separations in practice. Okay, sounds interesting. And how did you feel there? Because eight months is too much. Maybe you either like it or hate it. And also you're in the middle of almost nowhere, Hammond, Indiana. <laughs> how, yeah. how does a young student cope with that? So the location was not ideal for for a 21 year old, there wasn't a whole lot of excitement to be had in, in Hammond, Indiana. Uh, but it was, it was a good, good work experience for sure. And at the end of the eight month internship, I went back to campus, went back to university for, I think about a, another year or so, and then had my second internship the summer in between my, my senior, my, my senior year and my fifth year. Okay, okay. And I know you also did this internship with Flint Hills Resources, which I know was the, step, the stepping stone for your actual first job. So how did you got that internship? It was a similar experience. They had some recruiters at the career fair. I went up and talked to them and I'd singled them out because I wanted to go and experience 
ha- have some work experience in the oil and gas industry. You know, it's for chemical engineers. I think it's one of the it's one of the top three industries that employs chemical engineers. So I wanted to go and have that experience, and they are located near my hometown. So location was great because they're right by the Twin Cities. And the position itself was a good fit for a young engineer because uh, as an operations engineer is what they they call their process engineers. Uh, You got really good field experience working with the different operators. You will be more or less hands-on with the equipment. You weren't the ones doing the field work, but you'd be out there uh, troubleshooting with the operators putting together a game plan for how to fix it, and then implementing that. Um, so all those things, all those three uh, criteria were met, and I had a wonderful time doing that internship. Okay. And I have one question for you, Alec. How, or give us some tips, or how do you sell yourself in a career fair? What do you think is relevant for Uh, a young student in order to get accepted or hire in an internship or co-op? Yeah, it's just like what you said. You you have to be able to sell yourself. And what that means is your ability to convey how the work that you've done is relevant to the work that they want you to do when you are employed by them. So you need to, they, they have an understanding that You have the technical skills and you'll be smart enough to pick up anything new that they throw at you. They want to see how well you can interact with people. I think that's the main focus when when you're at the career fair is how well can you relate to the people that you're talking to, to look them in the eye, to clearly communicate why you think you'd be an asset, why you'd be valuable working for them. And that's a great way to approach that that scenario. It may be intimidating that you're going to have to go and and sell yourself, but it's something that is a necessary skill in order to in order to get the positions that you desire. Yeah, that's true. Selling yourself in life overall. With- partners, with friends, with colleagues, at jobs. It's always something very important in life. Right. And it may not come naturally. It may be something that you need to practice on. So don't be afraid to use your parents, use use friends, heck, even practice in the mirror. Uh, it's, it's something that you need to be able to feel comfortable with um, if you're going to, if you're really going to excel in in the real world. It's true. Practice makes better always. So the more you practice, the more internships, interviews you get, the better. Even though you don't want or you're not interested in that internship, it will help you to get the internship of your dreams. Right. Okay. So Alec, now let's say that you finished your internship and you graduated. So what was your main idea when you graduated? Did you got a job offer directly or was it uh, afterwards as you were searching for a job and then you, let's say you accepted the formal offering Flint Hills. So I was lucky enough that they offered me a job once I graduated. So at the end of the internship, uh, they say, we'd love to have you back. And I accepted that. And I was able to, what was great about, uh, working for that company is they were flexible on my start date. So I didn't, have to start until September of the following year, which gave me the summer after I graduated to go and do some traveling. I spent a few months in Europe and then came back and and started at the refinery. That's, that's great. Actually, that's a very great, I'll say, I don't, I don't know how to say, but that's awesome that they think on you and they know that you're just graduated that you want some time for you and they will be willingly going to, wait for you. So congratulations. That means that you did a very good impression at the internship. Yeah. And so I I would encourage others who have that travel itch to ask, ask if that's an option, if they're in a similar position, you know, if they can postpone their start date, 
a month, maybe a two months after graduation to give them that opportunity to go, go and travel. Cause you won't have, it's rare to have, you know, a four five, six week break from work where you can go and, and do some solid traveling. Mm -hmm. That's true, actually. And you can also, let's say, get a little bit in depth in that vacations because you know that you're going back for a work that's going to be getting, getting you a good pay. Right. Okay. So now let, let us know more on that. So what was your first formal job? First formal job was operations engineer in the hydrogen systems at the Pine Bend refinery. What were you doing in reality? So you're operation engineer for the hydrogen system in a refinery. What's, what's all that about? Correct. So you are heavily involved in the day-to-day -day operations of your units. So what that involved was monitoring, troubleshooting, and optimization of these units to ensure that your safety, environmental, and production goals are being met. So on a, the analogy that I like to use is if you picture the refinery as a hospital, the operations engineers were the nurses in, char in charge of a handful of patients. So we would come in each morning, we'd be checking their vital signs, making sure that they were operating or that, that they were healthy and they were able to make it to their next surgery, quote unquote. In, in this case, surgery would be a turnaround. So every four, five, or six years, kind of depending on the, the unit, we would take the unit offline, change catalyst, do any sort of major maintenance on it, and then start it back up again. And did you have a mentor or a trainee, or how did you get from, let's say, zero to hero? <laughs> we, I was lucky enough that I had a mentor who was very influential in my development early on. Uh, but it wasn't a formal mentor. It was just a coworker that I shared a cubicle with. And I would be constantly bouncing ideas off of him, kind of talking about, hey, does this make sense? Uh, what's the best way to approach it with the operators? And he was always willing to, to spare his time uh, to help me get better. And okay. if you can find something like that, in your position, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be your manager or doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a supervisor. Other coworkers are great resources to get to speed. Yeah, it's true. Getting a mentor is crucial and not, not always you will have the opportunity to get one. So if you get one, get the most of that. Absolutely. Let's say I, I'm seeing right now that you went also from hydrogen systems to gasoline systems. How was that? jump? Did you ask for it or were you invited or was it mostly compulsory to change? So it was expected as an operations and engineer that you'd get exposure to different units. You'd go and work on different units. So it's a natural transition for me after about two years or so to move from the utility side into more hydro processing, uh, which is a little more technical. There's going to be more responsibility It's also a different part of the refinery. So you get exposure to new challenges. You start working with a different group of operators and it's a higher level of, you know, think about it. It's, it's making the next step in, in a career. Like more responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of going from, from thermo one into thermo two. You're going to be asked to do more rigorous calculations. It's going to be more demanding, uh, more challenging, but in the end, it, it's usually more satisfying. So I really enjoyed that, that part of it. And can we get a little bit technical and let us know what were you doing with the NAFTA and how did you convert it, let's say, low quality materials into high value materials in gasoline? Yep. So and that's, that's the essence of chemical engineering is taking low value materials and upgrading them. So 
For those that are unfamiliar with the refining process, crude oil is a mixture of different components. It's got diesel, naphtha, which is also gasoline, uh, asphalt, which is the, the really thick, you know, really high boiling point stuff, and then light ends, which is propane, butane, and, and the higher and the lighter stuff. So the naphtha comes from the, the crew towers after being separated, and it's our job to first hydrotreat it, which removes the sulfur and nitrogen um, down to specifications set by uh, the EPA. And then that hydrotreated material gets sent to an upgrading unit where we increase the octane of the naphtha from about a 50 or 60 RON up to anywhere from 85 to 95 RON. So those are the, if you ever go at the gas pump and you're looking and you're curious about the numbers on at the gas station, that's what they're, they come from is, is the octane rating. Exactly. It's like a quick measure on how the fuel is going to be exploding inside the chambers or the engine chambers. <laughs> so did, did you like what? What did you like the most, the gasoline systems or hydrogen systems? I, oh, that's a good question. Uh, they were both different. They offered new challenges. I think being in hydrogen was preferred because they had a unique hydrogen purification system that's kind of unusual for, for chemical engineers. It's, it's the pressure swing absorption unit. Uh, but I found that that fascinating. There's also a, a moment in time when hydrogen was in high demand, and so there's a lot of um, a lot of change going on within the system. That was fun to be a part of. Okay. Now talking about gas or oil and gas industry, how do you feel always being there? Uh, because there's always going to be a shortage. There's always going to be surplus. Sometimes there's crisis. Mm -hmm. How did you felt? Did you always? felt sure or confident that your job is not going to be like terminated soon? In, in that position, I, I felt secure uh, working at, at that refinery, but I know industry-wide that's not the case. And it is very much a cyclical environment, a cyclical industry, you know, as we've seen this year, which is you know most evident. Uh, but it's... Yeah, it can be boom bust, and you have when you sign on to that, you have to understand the risks involved with working in that industry. Yeah, it's actually any industry is also dependent on fuel, so it's or energy. It's kind of impossible to find a single industry, maybe food that you were also a part of. Maybe food and beverage industries can be a little bit more stable, but Well, before changing to your, let's say, to the SKE food group part of you, what else would you say? Or I want you to share something on being in a refinery, something either great or something that you didn't like that much. Um, good question. It was, I think it's everything that a young process engineer can hope for. There is every unit operation that you learned about in college It is so intertwined. You know, everything impacts different units uh, that it, it's another level of complexity that you need to, to factor in when you're making decisions on how best to operate your unit. And what I really enjoyed about being an operations engineer is that you were encouraged to view your unit as your own business. And so how would you maximize profits within your business. In this case, it was, it was the hydrogen systems, it was the naphtha systems. So that was a unique approach to thinking about how to set your day-to-day -day operation that, that I really enjoyed. Things that weren't the greatest, um, being in production means that you're on call 24-7. So it can be a little stressful because things will break, things will go wrong, and you're the one that needs to take charge and formulate a plan on how to get things back on track. There's going to be things that come up at 2 a.m. 
that you'll get calls about and you may need to, to go in and, and work on it. Uh, but overall, it is a really good experience early on because you get a lot of exposure, you get a lot of responsibility, and it's stuff that you will carry with you for the rest of your career. I also think production is very rough, but life balance, it's always your own call. Something happens, you gotta suspend all your activities and go back to the uh, facilities. So yeah, it's kind of a specific job profile that will fit there. Right. Alec, now let us know why did you change from your refinery pro uh, work into food industry? How was the change? So the change was brought about my desire to do a broader variety of, of tasks. And this was a unique opportunity in that they had just opened up SK Food. had just opened up a new facility and they were looking for a plant engineer to run their ammonia system. So I knew I would get more hands-on experience. I would be the go-to guy for uh, the entire operation, as well as having to wear some other hats like safety management um, and doing some, some production scheduling as well. Okay. And one question, what was the use of ammonia system for that specific food industry? If you can let us know. Yep. So this wasn't used in the manufacture of the food. This was to cool the freezers and refrigerators. Mm, okay. So mostly like a refrigerant. Correct. Okay. Nice. Nice. And what else can you let us know on being a plant engineer? Because you were young. I am assuming that you were, what, 28 years old? That was, yeah. Yeah, it was 2000. And Alec, I want to know more on the FDA and the USDA. I know those are agencies very, let's say, picky or hard to deal with. How did you have some cases in which you had problems with them or was it pretty straightforward to follow the guidelines? It's pretty straightforward. I mean, they are a strict, uh, strict set of regulators, but they want to make sure that whatever you're producing is going to be safe for an individual to to ingest uh, which makes perfect sense and they want to see that you've developed a plan and that you're sticking to the plan so whatever it is that you write down you need to make sure that you're sticking to it so that you can prove to the regulators that this is our process here's and it's been thoroughly researched thoroughly developed and we're we're doing what we say that we is we're doing what we say that we're going to do, like that's that's how you are able to form a very positive relationship with with your inspectors. I didn't know because here in Mexico it's not that common to see regulators, and when you see them, it's well, it's you know you need to know how to get along with them. But I don't know how it's in the U.S. if they are way more strict or harder to deal with. So it's great news that if you are all in place, it's going to be a smooth transition to, towards that. Yep. It's about, you need to have, be transparent when things go wrong, have a plan put together for, for how you can get things back on track. They, they understand that mistakes and accidents occur. So just be honest with them. Don't try to hide anything. Good tip for all our friends in hazard safety control. So now I know, or I have this little note, which is kind of interesting, that you wanted to go to the West, to California, because you wanted to see more mountains and more outdoor activities. So besides that, what made you change from food industry to towards Ampac into fine chemicals? Yeah, so Ampac is a contract pharmaceutical manufacturer. Uh, they're located in the northern part of California near Sacramento, uh, very close to Lake Tahoe, which was a big selling point for me. And this seemed like a, kind of a natural progression from the position I was in previously, working with working with the ammonia system and dabbling a little bit with food production. But now it's going to be more technical because the chemistry was much more intensive and complex 
Um, and I have another opportunity to be out in the field, working with operators, being hands-on with the process. Okay. And how was it to, co to get along with them? Do you have problems or was it easier because you have already been working in many uh, process industries? So I was able to draw my experience from, from the refinery in the sense that this was another union facility. And working at, at union facilities can be tricky because you are not allowed to take work away from a union employee. So what that, what that looks like is you won't be the one turning a wrench or opening a valve, but you will be directing the operators to do so and having a good relationship with your operators will make or break your experience at a process plant. So it is so important that early on you go out there and you try and, and see what their day-to-day -day life is like, understand what their pain points are, understand their incentives for why they do things one way versus another so that you can form a really healthy relationship and look at it through through their eyes. Yeah, that's true. Working with operators, especially if they're in, in union, which is kind of common, it's very hard because you need to know how to deal with them without, of course, making huge problems with the, the union control. And also, as you stated, they are the ones that are doing the actual job. So if you get along with them, you tell them to do the job, they will do it gladly. Otherwise, it will be a long pain for you as a process engineer or plant manager to make things happen. So thank you for sharing that, Alec. Oh, absolutely. Let us know more on impact fine chemicals. So how, because changing from maybe bulk chemicals or let's say, I think that the material is not that technical or uh, not that safety issues, not into healthy and so on, but in fine chemicals, specifically with pharma industry, how, how was that switch to, from, let's say, working with crude oils into working into pharmas? So there was a little bit of a learning curve for me because in commodity, commodity manufacturing, manufacturing of commodities like oil and gas uh, and other petrochemicals, uh, the quality, there's certain quality standards that need to be met, um, but they can be met fairly, um, fairly easily. And if they're not you know, based on having the correct process, and then if things aren't going right, you can always just rerun, rerun it through the refinery and, and you know, get it to where it needs to be. On the pharmaceutical side, it's much more rigorous that the processes are set up in place and will not be modified to create that product. Because what the regulators and inspectors want to see is that you are able to manufacture a consistent product based on this process you've developed, and you can do it each and every day for every batch that's produced. So that, what, what I struggled with early on was the fact that there's not a ton of daily optimization that gets to take place um, in, in a pharmaceutical manufacturing environment as compared to something like a refinery. And the reason for that is if you start making tweaks to the process, you don't have a full understanding of how that may impact the the quality of of the product and knowing this what would you prefer to work on either refinery or food industry pharma industry the refinery I'm, i like being i like tweaking things i'm always curious about well, what happens if we were to to raise this temperature up a little bit and, and optimize over here uh, kind of a I'm a tinkerer, so that being in that environment, I think, is much more conducive to uh, to me enjoying it, as opposed to a more rigorous and inflexible manufacturing environment. Yeah, definitely. Being having the opportunity or that flexibility of 
being able to design your changes or uh, moving operation conditions and checking out how it's going to come out the, pro the product from the process, that's great. I did have some experience on that and um, having some flexibility to change, but not that drastic. And I will have love to have more, uh, let's say, place or more uh, opportunity to do changes on the process. I think that's the essence of chemical engineering, always changing conditions in order to improve or to optimize something. Right. Okay, Alex. So now, how was California? Did you enjoy it? California was wonderful. <laughs> Would you like, because I know that currently you are in Chicago. So if you were to get the same job right now in California, would you stay in California or would you really wanted to go to uh, Chicago? Absolutely. If I, if I could have this, the current role out in California, I would be, that'd be ideal. Um, okay. I didn't, didn't realize that Illinois was the second flattest state in the U S. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's a lot of flatness out there. It's, way better. Uh, I also live near the mountains, so it's way better to have mountains. There's a lot of things to do, hiking, camping, uh, jeeping, off-roads, whatever you want to, it's there. Yep. Well, now let's talk about your current job. How? And I'm very interested because Honeywell, it's a very known uh, company. It's may, it may be the dream job of many fellow chemical engineers. So, From being on Ampac Fine Chemicals, how did you transition to Honeywell? Were you looking for it, waiting for the opportunity, or did you got it invited? So it was both. There was a desire to come back to the Midwest because I wanted to be closer to family. And I was familiar with UOP, uh, which is the company that's, that's owned by Honeywell, because they license many of the technologies that are used in the refinery. And when I was in the hydrogen systems, uh, I worked closely with their pressure swing absorption units. <clears throat> so I was familiar with the technology. I got along really well with one of the, the folks that worked at UOP and she and I had stayed in touch and she passed along a, a job opening that had come up in the tech service group and I applied and then was lucky enough to get an interview. The interview went well and made the move in, in September of, of last year and have really just enjoyed uh, being in this role. Okay, so what does a technical service specialist do? So we are the subject matter experts for these units. So if an operator has questions on issues that they're seeing, or if they want to optimize their operation, they call us and we help work them through those solutions. So in a simplified way, it's a bit like the geek squad for Best Buy. And those are folks that um, would help troubleshoot issues with you know, personal electronics. Um, this is something similar, except it's with a hydrogen purification technology that's used in refineries and petrochemicals sites. Okay. Okay. So you're the guys to go. And is that like a unit that gives service to other Honeywell, let's say units as well, or is it mostly external clients? It is all external clients. So examples of companies, can you say, can you share? Yeah. So it's, um, Pemex, for example, has owns, a few of our units, uh, pretty much, we've got thousands of these units across the world. So all mm -hmm. the major oil and gas, oil and gas companies. Yeah. So Exxon, Chevron, uh, Philips 66 over in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait. Okay. So it's all around the world. So that's, that's interesting. Let us know more on that house. How does it feel to work all, uh, do you have, let's say your team, is it mostly located in your current area or is it global team? It's a global team. So we've got a handful of tech service specialists in North America. And so we 
provide service to those in in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and parts of Central and South America. We've got a team in Dubai, a group of individuals in Europe, and another team in Delhi uh, that manages those uh, customers in their area. And then we also have a, a team in China and a team in, in Japan. Okay, so that's very broad to be honest. Yeah. It's very... It's but, nice to have, I assume. How how does it feel to uh, treat other fellow engineers all around the world? It's it's fascinating. And, you know, they've got because each one of them has a different perspective for uh, approaching solving the the problem, and it's it's fun working with them and seeing how they interact with the customer. Uh, because we both are able to arrive at the same answer for what the, the technical piece is, but they may have a different approach for how they engage with the customer to, to get them to do it. Okay. And what else can you share on the current job? Let us know more. And I don't know what's the interesting part, the boring part, uh, the difficult part. Sure. I'd say the most interesting part is the variety that comes up. Um, each day is usually something new that comes along and we're able to do a deep dive, a deep dive into what the issue may be, put together a very <clears throat> comprehensive solution, and then work with the customer to fix their issue. And so there's, from from that perspective, it's a very satisfying, fulfilling role because you're helping others solve these problems. The frustrating piece about it is that you're not at site to see what's going on. Uh, when when you're the process engineer and you're working on your units, you, know, you can go out and you can see, take in other things that may be affecting, may be contributing to this issue and formulate an opinion based on that. Here, it's all secondhand. So it kind of gets... It gets not filtered, but it has to go through somebody who's reporting things that are on site. And so you don't necessarily get all the information all at once. You kind of, there's always a little back and forth involved with that. Okay. And I'm reading right now this little note that says that you created a tool that integrated high sys modeling software with Excel. So let us know more about that. Yeah. So that's the Aspen simulation workbook. And it's a great way of taking information like data dumps uh, that your customer or somebody may, may put together, taking all that process data, putting it into a simulation and running different scenarios to optimize the unit. Okay, sounds great because, I don't know, as a student, you maybe think that HiSys or Aspen Plus is not so common or that you will never encounter this if you're not into process modeling. And it's funny to see an engineer that without being a process in, uh, simulation engineer, finishes using HiSys or Aspen Plus or, or any kind of these simulation softwares. Yeah. And so I was one of those individuals in, in school that said, oh, this is, I you know, kind of struggle with simulations. And I never thought that I would be the one using HiSys in the way that I am now. It's it's fun though, because I am not the one designing the HISIS model, but I get to use it to figure out what's the most optimal way for our customers to run their plants. Yeah, that's true. It's another way to work with process simulation. It's not actually doing the simulation per se, but integrating all the powerful tools of these softwares into actual usable stuff for the average process engineer or design engineer. Right. Alec, I also see here that you, and this is interesting because it sounds more into human resources part, but that you overhaul a new employee orientation program. So what's all about, or what's this about? Was it because you were having a, a lot of rotation and you didn't have the proper program or you wanted to improve it or what's up with this? This was a way of formalizing our onboarding program, our onboarding process for new employees. So in, in the past, there'd be 
you'd have a mentor, you'd have your manager and your coworkers that you relied on to get up to speed on the different technologies. Uh, but there wasn't real structure to it. It was mostly you'd go and find things on your own and go through it at at a pace that was dependent on whatever what it was going on in the office at that, that time. The project that I worked on was putting structure to that program. So what, what would it look like within your first 30 days? What did your first 60 days look like all the way up to um, one year? So that individuals that were new to the role could get up to speed quicker. They can make sure they're getting the right information early on and so that they can become self-sufficient and eventually operating at the same level that folks that have been there for, for many years were. Okay, that sounds great. It's also an engineering job to standardize processes and this is, was one process spending to be standardized, right? Yeah, and it was great for me because I did that. That was one of the first projects that I worked on after I hired and I was brand new to those technologies and how the company worked. And so being able to uh, organize and synthesize all that information through the lens of somebody who's going through it at that time was a great perspective to be in. Because it was like, well, if I don't know how to, don't know where to find something and I go in and I seek it out for the next person in line, how can I make that easier for them? Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, that's the dream of a proper organization that if you get one day missing or you just change jobs, that the organization will keep running without any uh, problems and so. Yeah. Okay, Alec, I, I'm reading right here that you are willing to learn more into automation or control PLCs and that you may want to check out a electrical engineering degree. What's all about that? Correct. So that is where every industry is headed, in my opinion, is being able to optimize their process and make sure that every day is their best production day. And the way that, that you accomplish that is through rigorous process control. And it's something that I got exposed to in, in college, had some more hands-on experience in the different roles that I've been in, but now I really want to take a formal approach to understanding PLCs and automation. Okay, that's interesting. It's very in interesting that I've heard this uh, in many interviews uh, of fellow chemical engineers. And I, and I will ask you this, would you say then that the chemical engineering program is lacking or has a deficiency on automation control and more into the actual, let's say, checking out the future of the industries? I do. I think that there that's certainly something that could be improved upon um, from my experience. Uh, we didn't get a whole lot of... I don't remember the labs that we did were very applicable to what we would encounter in in the real world. Mm -hmm. that's, that's true. I also remember having this application of filling up a tank It was a very silly one. And I mean, it's, of course, educational content, but it will be also great to have a more complex program or uh, process to automate. So, yeah, I'm on board with you. We need more automation, especially uh, if you want to have engineers that are actually competitable or let's say that can be compared with, I don't know, electrical engineers or mechanical engineers, because all then we will end up only being the typical process engineer, checking the computers, the, uh, the variables of the process, and we will not check out the actual control of the process and all that. Right. So it's a great uh, combination of skills to have where you understand the process, you know the, the chemistry behind what's taking place, And then you're able to take that knowledge and apply it to the and design the process control systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Alec, we are done with uh, your resume, which is awesome. Actually, as a process engineer, I, I see it and it's like, wow, this guy is like making his own way towards something great. 
So Alec, do you want to share something else regarding your experience, your, let's say, job experiences, some tips, or shall we pass to the quick question and answer section? I think that young engineers, when you're early on in your career, don't be afraid to go and explore different industries, different roles, and things that you may find interesting. Uh, it's a learning process early on, and you will know what you like and what you don't like. Sometimes, but sometimes you have to do that by trial and error. And the things that you find out you don't like are just as important as those you find out you do like. So it may be intimidating to, to move around and to start new, but it's, a growing, it's part of the growing process. I think that it's, it's valuable for those that want to get exposure to, to different industries and positions in order to figure out exactly what it is that they want to go and do long term. Okay, that's a great tip. Thanks for sharing, Alec. Okay, guys, so you got it, Alec. Uh, just proposed that I also think that exploring different areas and industries is always important, makes you relevant, can also give you certain, let's say, I don't know how to say this, but when the engineer is so focused in something and it's so used to do something, you get out of the box when you get to other areas and job titles and industries. Okay, Alec, now let's do some quick question and answers. As you told me, you already know how this is carried out. So I'm going to shoot you a quick question on student life. Okay. So what would you remove from your bachelor syllabus? Any subject? I would replace some of the humanities requirements with required business classes. Okay, that's nice. That's interesting. And that's also something I get a lot that remove humanities or all those uh, stuff or subjects that are not into actual chemical engineering. So that's a good answer. What do you think is overrated in chemical engineering? I think that MATLAB is overrated. I, I think it's important to introduce programming software and to get exposure to that, but I haven't used it once since university. So I don't know if there's a better program that that's out there that's more ubiquitous in industry, but in my experience, no one really uses MATLAB outside of academia. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, well, maybe integrations between pro simulations or you haven't encountered that as well? No, I haven't seen that. Okay, that's a good tip, guys. So if you're into MATLAB and you're suffering, maybe you're not, that's going to be your last time in your life. Yeah. Do you have any favorite engineering books? Yes. So there's a book called What Went Wrong, and it's case studies of different process, uh, of different process plant disasters and how they could be avoided. And reading that made me realize why and how a lot of the rules and regulations are developed. It's because these things have happened before and they want to prevent it from happening again. And therefore you have to do X, Y, and Z or make sure that your, your system is adhering to these different policies. So that was really an eye opening and insightful read uh, to help understand why we do the things the way that we do. I, I've heard about the book and I want to, learn, uh, to read it, but never actually took the time to search for it and download it or buy it. So thank you for that. It's also important, I think, for any process engineer, especially if you're into safety or into very hazardous materials, that's something, of course, you want to check out first. Okay, so this is, of course, personal, but what do you think are relevant master degrees to get as general chemical engineers? I think an electrical engineering master's degree or a master's degree in automation and process controls will be very valuable for anybody with a chemical engineering background. I was expecting that. I wanted to see if you uh, could offer other like random master degree, but that's fine. Actually, automation is a way great to go. I met this professor back in university. He had a artificial intelligence and he had no, artificial intelligence PhD. He was working on that and he had a automation master degree and at the moment for me this was like what the uh, what the hell is why he's studying into that he's so non-chemical engineer oriented and now i understand everything 
that's making a lot of sense. He's actually like a pioneer for me. That's really interesting. Yeah, it was the artificial intelligence part was, okay, yeah, you want something to improve the process with artificial intelligence, not someone doing like processes and changing just for the sake of changing and verifying the outcomes. Yeah. Okay, so what was the subject that you hated the most in chemical engineering? I really struggled with physical chemistry. Mm, yeah, I did as well. It's kind of hard. But I, it's once you get it, it's great. But getting it is the so abstract material and yeah, it's hard to digest. Yeah, because when you get down to the that microscopic level or the quantum level, like all the normal uh, physics don't apply. So you have to learn a whole new rules for how objects interact with each other. And I, I don't know, I, I found it difficult to wrap my head around that. Yeah, it's like the first steps to get abstract understanding of the universe. And we are so used like physical or chemical stuff that you see or you can relate to. So when you get to do some crazy math and I don't know, all the Maxwell equations, it's so crazy. Yes. Okay, now let's pass to professional life questions. So did you have any kind of first job that was not chemical engineering related? Let's say waiting tables or I don't know, whatever you may have worked before. Yeah, I worked for a landscaping company. Now, what were you in, doing? In high school. And it was my best friend's dad's company. And he owned a series of neighborhood developments. And we were in charge of doing the maintenance on the lawns, picking up garbage, making sure that the lots looked presentable for prospective home buyers. So mm, we, okay, sounds nice. Yeah, and what it taught me is that you need to be prepared each morning with with a game plan for what you're going to go and do, so that you can you know accomplish what needs to get done. Mm -hmm. That's true. Always you can get some valuable lessons from experiences and this was for sure one okay so what are the top skills of a chemical engineer or what would you expect from them so in addition just to having a solid foundation in math and chemistry i think somebody who's curious having that that trait to go and figure out what the answer may be to a, a new a new problem or a new challenge that they haven't encountered is such a valuable uh characteristic to have mm -hmm. that's true strong foundation foundations and math for sure for an engineer and chemistry as well okay so would you consider a, yourself a leader yes in the sense that i like having the the tools available and being able to get support from from others in order to accomplish a specific task okay so the question will be how does one becomes a leader it starts with knowing i think it starts with knowing what people's incentives are for why they should follow you and yeah. if you can tap into that if you can look at it from their perspective and think about well what's in it for them how can they benefit from working with me? Then that's how you create a, um, a really positive relationship with, with your teammates. That's true. Always having a great team to work is definitely sure for a leader. You cannot be a leader by yourself. You always need to work with others. Right. Okay. What's, what is your dream job if you can have one? Oh, the My dream job would be more of a consulting role where I get to travel, I can work, be hands-on with the equipment, maybe designing process control systems, the, the HMI uh, programs, and doing the installation and starting it up and kind of being that, that cradle-to-grave uh, process. I think it would just be a lot of fun to have ownership over your work schedule, being being maybe an independent contractor, uh, and also having the ability to work closely with customers on developing 
and improving their systems. Okay, it sounds very realistic, very objective. So that's great. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're working towards that. Yes, that's that's the goal. Okay, let's hope that you get that eventually into that position. Okay, so what is the best advice you were given? Best advice that I was given was from my former manager. And he, he said, trust but verify. And what he meant by that was, and he's talking about this in the context of, of operators, that a lot of them will form opinions about what it is that's causing an issue. And it's not completely being, it's not pulled out of thin air. They've got um, a experience and, and knowledge of the systems that allows them to arrive at that conclusion. So trust that what they're saying is accurate in their eyes, but then follow up and verify that that's, that is what's going on. Uh, so what, what that means in practice is taking those opinions and those thoughts and then investigating for yourself and verifying whether or not that's accurate, if it's partially accurate, or what needs to be uh, modified in order to fully explain what's going on. Okay, that's a great tip. That's true. Always verify for yourself. If, because if, it, of course, you need to trust because you cannot verify everything. But what you need to verify, it's always important for your current job. Okay, so I have this question that I'm pretty sure that you already know about. So it's about the Laplace transform. <laughs> have you used it? No, I have not seen it used outside of a textbook. Okay, still I looking for an engineer. I think if you talk with your buddy who's doing the automation, or sorry, the artificial intelligence masters, he may use Laplace transform. Yeah, it might be. Even though I, I remember I questioned one other fellow engineer, he was into automation. He told me, no, that's it's like inter integrals that you no longer use them in the real job. You use them like someone does that for you. You no longer draw the S form of the integral and add the DX and the function, even though you are actually using them in your calculations. Right. Right. It's all happening on the, the back end, behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So let us know your thoughts on chemical engineering and the industry 4.0, which I already hear a little bit on you, but let us know what's your forecast. Yeah, I think it's going to be ubiquitous. It's, it's going to be... Um, <clears throat> present in every industry, certainly in the oil and gas industry, uh, where we, the companies are focused on optimization of their current systems, you know, making sure that they are as energy efficient as possible. And the way that happens is through very rigorous process controls. And through you know, food and beverage and pharmaceutical, the same thing applies. Now it's being able to show regulators and to prove that the processes developed can produce the same quality product day in and day out. And what was really interesting working at Ampac was seeing the transition, seeing how companies are trying to make the transition from batch chemistry into continuous uh, for making pharmaceuticals. And there's a lot of benefits to having a continuous process versus a batch process. And one of the biggest hurdles for that is how can you ensure that your product is being made to its specifications each day? And you do that with very rigorous process control, and that's what um, and that's what industry 4.0 is going to be is having all those sensors hooked up and making sure that things are being adjusted appropriately. Sounds interesting forecast. Let's see. Hey, I'm pretty sure it's already happening. So maybe some colleagues have been working already on the vision you're telling us. And I'm for sure it's going to be something great for process engineers to see this revolution and be part of it. Yeah. Okay, so random questions just to finish. Alec, 
Do you drink coffee, tea, energy drinks, or what do you use to get active at the workplace? I do a combination of tea and coffee. So most days I'll just do tea, but there's some occasions when I prefer coffee if I need a little extra caffeine boost. Okay, that's great. So what are your hobbies? I really enjoy outdoor activities. So I've got a, a trip lined up in a couple of weeks to go rock climbing in Nevada. And I try and stay stay active. Um, so there's a climbing gym that uh, I go to quite often. Okay. I also know that you like cooking. So what are your let's see, special recipes or what do you prefer to cook? <laughs> so lately I've been doing some good winter meals. So that's stews and soups. Uh, but it's also this, there's this great curry dish that I've become obsessed with because uh, it's super flavorful and very easy to put together. I'm also into curry, but here it's been a long time I haven't tried good curry dish. <laughs> okay, Alec. Well, I think we are done with the quick questions. Do you want to add a final thought before we make a final closure? I'd say just for those that are, are in chemical engineering and looking ahead to what industries they may want to go into, keep your options open. Uh, things things will come up that you never would expect yourself to be in and maybe take those opportunities. Okay, yeah, that's true. Always go for more, be hungry and always stay waiting or be ambitious. Always try to grow, change company if you can do so. And yeah, definitely great tip, Alec. Yeah. Well, friends, this was Alex Lungard, a process engineer working currently at Honeywell as a technical specialist. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you, Alec, and to the public or the audience. We'll see each other in the next episode. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And before you go, I will really appreciate it if you take the time to share this podcast with your fellow colleagues, classmates, friends, or really anyone that might be interested on the topic of chemical engineering and its related fields. If you found this content helpful and valuable, please consider subscribing, writing, and leaving a review. Thank you so much for your support. It really means a lot.